people, when you ask them to part with their hard earned dollars, their, their first reaction is, why are you trying to scam me? What are you gonna do with my money? Yeah, I'm is it never a scam? gonna give back. Yeah. Yeah. And I love to contrast that with, with political giving because uh, it just seems so easy in, in the current times that we live in for people to raise money for political candidates where they're getting a 0% return and a guaranteed 100% loss of capital. And yet people part with it. Yeah. Uh, but something psychologically, when I come to them and I say, hey guys, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and we have a great track record of delivering 20% returns on people's invested capital. And the first thing they look at me, they're like, whoa, whoa, man, what, are you trying to scam me, bro? All right, guys, we are back with how to invest in CRE.com. It's been a little while. Congrats to my man, Braden, who just had his third child. Yes. Uh, he's been at the house doing dad duty and helping out his beautiful wife, uh, getting settled with all three kiddos. But we are back today. And the topic today, we're going to be going over some of your most frequently asked questions. Brian, why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because whenever some, we ask someone to give us some money, they uh, are a little apprehensive. They don't want to part with their money. And so they always have a bunch of questions for us. And this, uh, we decided we'd go ahead and answer those today. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of your, your duty. You know, when you go to give somebody a large sum of money and, you know, right now, average check size could be well north of $100,000. So when you're thinking about, you know, that potential amount of money, they're going to ask you a few questions. It's like buying a house. It's, you know, typically a, a massive purchase. Um, and they want to understand how it works, at least at a high level, so they can come home, tell their partner, tell their spouse, you know, know how it works, sleep better at night, everything like that. Makes sense. You no, know, it's so interesting to me. You know, we've talked about it before. People, when you ask them to part with their hard-earned dollars, their their first reaction is, "Why are you trying to scam me? What are you going to do with my money? Yeah, I'm is never going to give it back." Yeah, yeah. And I love to contrast that with with political giving because. Uh, it just seems so easy in, in the current times that we live in for people to raise money for political candidates where they're getting a 0% return and a guaranteed 100% loss of capital. And yet people part with it. Yeah. Uh, but something psychologically, when I come to them and I say, hey, guys, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and we have a great track record of delivering 20% returns on people's invested capital. And the first thing they look at me, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa man, what, are you trying to scam me, bro? Yeah, where's mm -hmm. the catch? And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Yeah. But that's that's the reality of it. When we go to try to make our investors money, they're gonna be more skeptical of us than if we just ask them to support our our nonprofit or our political cause and they'll say, hey, Joel, here's here's the money, go, go do with it what you want, you know, because they're making a decision that it's gone. Yeah. But as soon as there's an expectation of return, uh, then you've got to, you've got to put them at ease that you're going to actually perform. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll just start it off here. One of the first ones I get typically every single time is what, what the heck am I investing in? Like what, what is it? Is it mm -hmm. a REIT or is it a partnership? How does this work? Do I, you know, is it like tenants in common? Are we joint tenants? How does this work? I'm not sure most investors are going to know what exactly joint tenants are versus tenants in common, but to <laughs> went a little too far on that. Yeah. One. Yeah. <laughs> To put it as simply as possible, you are uh, buying shares in a company that's going to actually yeah. own real estate. So this LLC, limited liability company, is going to own property, and you're going to actually have ownership shares in that company. So it's real ownership and property. So yeah. give me give me some quick pros and cons on the difference between a REIT and direct investing in an LLC that actually owns the real estate. Okay, I mean, well, what's, what's the biggest... Okay, well, benefit. I don't know the negatives of a REIT, so you'll have to handle that. What's but, the benefit? But, but of the benefit of, of direct uh, ownership is uh, all the tax advantages that you get; those get all passed down through all the, uh, the 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 profits. Those are passed down through. So um, essentially, you're you're investing in a company, and all the advantages that come with that, you get to participate in all those. Exactly. So the the biggest downfall with a REIT is that you're not investing in real estate, you're investing in a company that owns a bunch of real estate and they're legally mandated to distribute 90% of the profits. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a REIT. You don't get a lot of the tax advantages like depreciation, which is a, a massive one. And that's huge. That's one of the biggest reasons to invest in commercial real estate is to kind of shelter some of that uh, passive income you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I didn't know you didn't get that in a REIT. I've never invested in a REIT, so I don't know. Well, compared Glad to- Glad I didn't. Yeah, compared to direct <laughs> investing in real estate, REITs kind of suck. Yeah. Okay, so we, 
now that they know what they're investing in, the first thing, the next thing they're going to ask is, well, well, how much money do I need to invest? Yeah. Um, that's typically, I do get that a lot. Yeah. They don't know. Is there a half a million dollar minimum? Um, maybe they've got 25,000. Is that enough? You guys not taking people of that size. So Braden with criterion, what, what are you, what are you telling them? Yeah. So our minimum at criterion is a $25,000 investment. And that's just, uh, you know, the, the minimum to get in the door, you know, you can do any number above that. Um, but the minimum investor is is twenty five thousand dollars. So at Precision Equity, we've done uh, a minimum of fifty before. Uh, now we typically try to do a minimum of twenty five because we want to get people participating. Because if we can get them familiar with investing in real estate, chances are we're going to make them money and they're going to come back over and over. And I get them in the game. Uh, and some people, if you put a too high minimum, they're they're not going to be able to pull the trigger. So we we've essentially lowered to twenty five. Uh, I guess every deal is different, but. Yeah. And the reason why people set their minimums higher is to not just get more money out of you. It's, it's the burden of investors, all the paperwork and the, the paperwork, you know, our, our last stack of paperwork for the criterion building in Owasso was 102 pages, 102 pages. And you don't have to read every page and fill in every page. And uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of paperwork. You have to file a K one for that person. You have to, um, you know, handle their tax problems. You have to answer their phone calls. You have to, I mean, it's, decent amount of work of having 50 investors versus 10 investors on the same deal. I'd rather have 10. Yeah. you got to limit the number of investors to, to keep all those costs down really. Yeah. But at the same time, it's such a high barrier to entry. A lot of people can't go buy an apartment complex. Last apartment complex I looked at was $39 million. And I didn't, I mean, that's shocked the crap out of me because it was so expensive, but it's the general idea of you're aggregating a ton of people's money together to go and, and buy this because that's more beneficial. You get a nicer property. So part of the pitch is for our investors is they may have a hundred thousand or 200,000 and do they want to put that all down in their first commercial deal and try to figure that out? Well, if they're investing with us or uh, with one of these companies that we own, now they can spread that 200,000 over eight deals. Um, now they get some diversification, maybe over even different asset classes, different states. And, and they're with a group that has a proven track record versus betting all of that on their first commercial deal more mm -hmm. risk and more work. So it's pretty appealing to most people. Okay. Yeah. Going back to diversification, you also have, you know, in addition to the States and asset classes, you've got different timings of allocating the money in the market. You've got all of um, the different paybacks. Some might not be paying cash flow. There'll be a development or um, a lump sum at the end. Some may be paying quarterly cash flow. And it's just the idea that you should try to be in on, on almost every single deal is, is kind of what I say, like, yep. let's get an amount that you can kind of do quarterly or, or maybe once or twice a year? I would say a lot of our investors do uh, invest in most offerings uh, just to get their investment um, diversified. So they've invested, they know they're buying a ownership shares in a company that's going to own real estate. Uh, what is the payback schedule and, and how do you pay that back? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Another question is how do you initially get the money too? You know, is it check? Is it wire? Both of those. And then payback is, is different. You know, you're going to have some different time frames. I mean, we've got a couple different time frame of deals right now. And I mean, all all different types of deals have a different payback period. Yeah. Um, if we're just buying some cash flow, then it's typically quarterly dividends. Um, but like you said, sometimes we do some other uh, development projects where um, we're not going to realize cash flow at first. And so that's more of a sometimes it's a buy and hold, but sometimes it's a buy and and, and resell quickly and just just uh, it's one lump sum check at the end of the deal. Exactly. Might just be uh, 18 to 24 months. All that's going to be outlined up front. I would say a majority of precision equity deals uh, have been cash flow producing deals. So let's say we close uh, in August. Um, you know, we're probably paying a prorated dividend at the beginning of October for that third quarter. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's half of a distribution. If we planned on paying 12 percent annually, then quarterly it's it's three percent. Maybe they get a point and a half for that first quarter. Yeah. Uh, but generally we're trying to pay quarterly distributions in Starting line with what we projected when we the pitched purchase. the deal. Yeah. Okay. So who, uh, so can everybody in, invest in every deal? Are there any, um, sometimes we've done some deals where you have to be a accredited investor. And so what does that mean? Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's two main buckets that I want to focus on for the purpose of this question. There's a lot more levels of sophistication when it comes to being an investor, you can be a qualified investor, you can be a qualified purchaser, you can be a bunch of different things. But the two 
I want to focus on is sophisticated and accredited. So sophisticated means you're not a millionaire and you don't make $200,000 a year. Accredited means you're a millionaire, excluding your personal home. And you make $200,000 a year or you and your spouse uh, jointly make $300,000 a year and boom, you're an accredited investor. And really what the SEC is just trying to protect is the, the, you know, the blue collar worker. Um, a lot of regulation comes down to, you know, like residential real estate and a lot of the, the consumer they want to protect from being defrauded. Whereas when you start to get to be a sophisticated investor and a millionaire and, and that sort of annual income amount, it's, it's a higher level sophistication and you've started to amass enough wealth to where you're typically investing in other places outside of yourself. So you become more comfortable, more aware of, of the the term and the jargon, and you may have an attorney, you may have a CPA, you've, you've got more behind you than just, you know, you can't go out to Walmart and hold a sign that says, I'll, I'll take your money, you know, if, if you can be an accredited investor. Yeah, I think the important thing is um, people that have a million dollar net worth or make $300,000 a year, they can afford to lose some amount of money of that and still be okay. Yeah. Uh, and also, like you said, they have access to professionals that can give them guidance, education, information, where the average person that, that is a blue collar worker that works hard for their money, but just doesn't have a lot of spare money. They don't want uh, people like us trying to take advantage of those people getting their, their only $5,000 life savings and putting that at risk. And so that's really the difference um, between the creditive, which can invest in anything and, and the, the, the normal person that is not really, these investments aren't geared toward that person. Mm -hmm. Sophistication, it's kind of an in-between where they're educated, uh, they're, they can prove some familiarity with investing. Maybe they have a relationship with you. And they have to sign a disclaimer typically saying they acknowledge the risks. They acknowledge the risk. They understand what they're getting themselves into. And, and so that's really a, an in-between step. And our investments, you can only have a certain number of those. You can't do all Correct. sophisticated investors. You need to have some accredited and some sophisticated. Um, but that's another show probably. Yeah, so the black and white is if you're advertising. Like if you're advertising, if you have a billboard, if you have a Facebook campaign, if you're advertising to people you don't know, you can't take sophisticated people's money. Yeah. They have to be a millionaire. If you if you see an advertisement on Facebook, hey, invest with our invest in this deal. It's got to be for the deal, which is you know kind of an important point because yeah. they can advertise themselves as sponsors on general deals all they want. They can't advertise a specific offer. Yeah. Anyway, we'll okay. keep going. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I was going to say is okay. So now I've gotten paid and um, by you guys. And so it comes up to the end of the year. Um, what am I going to get for my taxes? And also the big question I get is why did you guys send me $10,000 during the year? But now my, my tax form that I get the K one has a loss on it. And why is that? And how does that benefit me? First of all, um, you get a K one because you're investing in a partnership and a partnership distributes K one. It's just a, yeah, the form's called a K one and it literally just pass through, uh, pass through right to your personal return mm -hmm. through an LLC. Yeah. It's an LLC tax as a partnership. So if and so it, it, it uh, reports profit and loss. Correct. Okay. Yep. And depreciation is written off as a loss. You, you pay it back when you sell the property um, and you pay the tax at that point, but today you get to write it off, which is a massive mm -hmm. tax advantage. So like you said, you could potentially get distributed, you know, a thousand dollars every month. Maybe you got $12,000 that year in distributions and you get your K one and it says you lost $15,000. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to call me up and you're going to say, Hey, my, I don't understand that. My capital yeah. balance has been reduced. It says I'm losing money. You guys yeah. paid me money. I, you know, I don't what's, understand it. what's going on here. Yeah. And we're just going to say, okay, that's from depreciation. We're going to pay this back when we sell. And that's the beauty about investing in commercial real estate. Mr. Smith is, you know, a lot of these distributions are tax sheltered, especially in the beginning because accelerated depreciation and accelerated depreciation right now is just one of those things in the tax code that isn't always there, hasn't always been there, maybe is not always there, but it's this awesome awesome way to just depreciate the crap out of the property. Yeah, really it's, a, fast. it's a paper loss because you're saying, Hey, this building is worth less this year than it was last year. And so we're going to allow you to take that depreciation up front, offset it versus the income that we gave you. And it just allows you to get that tax free income or partially tax free income until we recapture when we sell and it's recaptured at 25%. So if you're in a high tax bracket and we give you distributions, you're going to save, uh, let's say you're in a 40% tax bracket plus you know, state and federal, maybe almost 50%, you'd lose half of the money that we gave you. Well, in this case, mm -hmm. for the first few years, you're not gonna lose any of it or lose very little of it. And even when you do recapture, it'll be at half your normal rate. Mm 
-hmm. So really good tax advantages, but that's how the K-1s uh, are explained, I think. Okay, so speaking of tax advantages, uh, another question we get a lot is, can I invest using my 401k money? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Is that, uh, so what's the answer? Can, can people do that? Can they use 401k or IRA money? Absolutely, absolutely. It's gotta be in a self-directed account. There's tons of them out there now. Um, it's, it's super easy, reach out. Um, there's one called Custodian Trust Company I think they're located in Ohio. We have several investors use them. They're great to work with. It's an annual fee thing. Um, you fill out a form and then boom, they send us money from your 401k. We send your distributions back to them because they're the custodian just directed by you. That's why they call it a self-directed account. But yeah, we've helped several investors get those set up and invest with us and we've gotten great feedback from it. Mm -hmm. A couple questions I get um, frequently is how much money am I investing in the deal? Like they're just looking in the eye, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, you want uh, you want twenty five grand? Where's your twenty five grand, bro? And okay, yeah, we're we're direct investing as well. We typically are, you know, ten to a third, maybe more, of the money we're trying to raise. So if we're, we're trying to raise a million dollars, we're at least investing that one to three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, we're typically the largest investor. Criterion is usually the the large, or our our own money, our right. personal money is is typically the largest investor, or, or equal to some of the other couple of largest investors. It's it's treated parapasu, which literally is just a fancy word for the same. I just like to say it because it's fun, parapasu. Yeah, uh, Precision Equity is also typically the largest investor. I would say some of the, the best feedback I can give investors on why they should invest with a Criterion Fund or with Precision Equity is we invest a ton of our own capital. We believe in the deal. We are signing on the debt. So we're that was my other question. Yeah, that That's was a the great next one. one. Yeah. So we're signing on the debt. We're per, typically we're personally guaranteeing the debt, which means that uh, the deal doesn't go well. It's coming back on all of our personal assets. So it's going to give us extra motivation to hang in there, make that deal work, even put personal assets in on the deal in order to get through a rough patch. They like hearing that because we're not walking from the deal in the event there's an issue. Uh, and so those are two two big things. The other thing I, I tell people, which is a real benefit is uh, I'm putting my friends and family and coworkers money in these deals. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not raising money from people that we don't know that we've never met. It's really, really important to us that these deals work. And, and that's got to be a benefit because I've invested on, in several online investments. Two of the first three I did have turned out fraudulent. These are real estate. Uh, they're getting, yeah, real deals. estate deals getting indicted by the FBI wow. for mishandling investor funds. Several of the other ones are bigger funds. Where I thought, well, I'll, I'll, let's go big with these big companies. Surely they're going to do well. Yeah, find like a fund four or something. Yeah, <laughs> and they don't. Uh, they haven't hit their their numbers. Now they haven't. You know, those haven't lost my money. They haven't been fraudulent, but they have not met their performance standards. Well, they don't care about me or the other people they've met because they I invested on online through crowdfunding. They don't mm -hmm. know us. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, if if our deals don't hit our marks. I've got to sit around the table with my friends and family and tell them why, yeah. what happened. So it's uncomfortable. So for us, we have to believe in every deal we do before we're going to commit our own funds and before we're going to commit our friends and family's funds. So I think it's, if you're going to invest uh, in these types of deals, get to know your sponsor, get to know their track record and get to know, you know, previous investors and what kind of experiences have they had? Cause I think that's a real valuable tool. I think so too. And like you said, literally, in this group, we have to tell our moms and dads why we lost their money, our brothers and sisters, our uncles and aunts, and our kids, why we lost their money, yeah. literally. So Man, I don't wanna do that. Day. I don't wanna do it. No, I would rather not do it. So if it happens that we have to do that, that's I wanna make sure that I, I took every precaution, I knew about every risk, and I, I, I did my best uh, as a fiduciary to make sure that deal worked. Yeah. Last one, and then we may be able to call it unless you guys have something else. But um, how do you, how do you, why are you doing this? Are you doing this for free? Are you just doing this for me? Are you just doing this to help me out as the investor? Like why, yeah, why as a for sponsor, yeah. what's like, what's kind of in it for you? You know, that's a, that's a good question to ask. Most people ask it, how do you get paid? And we've got to disclose this, you know, two ways to Tuesday in that 103 page document. We've gone over this in another podcast. There's so many ways that a syndicator makes money. I mean, there are deals that I, we have done on our own without investors. Let's focus on the pref. Let's focus on the pref and the benefit okay. of the pref. Yeah. Um, well, we, we take fees up front, but then we pay a pref to the investor. So before the sponsor takes any split of the cash flow, we pay 8% uh, on the invested capital to the investor. 
Um, it's prorated quarterly. And then only when we exceed that target do we do we split what's left. And not by, by split, I mean maybe the investors get 65% of what's left over after 8% and we take 35% as a sponsor. So the, the investor has to win first before the sponsor can win. Right. To the tune of 8%, which is, I mean, in the it's grand scheme of things, not bad. Yeah, especially now. No, to put it, let's 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 take a typical deal. If it's a if it's a, a fourteen percent cash on cash deal, eight percent to the investor. That means you got six left over. And if it's a sixty five thirty five split, maybe it's approximately four to the investor and two to the sponsor. So the investor or the money is getting twelve percent, and the sponsor is getting two yeah. percent. If you look at it on a cash flow split split basis, so that uh, an investor should feel pretty good. That's a good split for the investor. And that's going to really uh, make the sponsor try to exceed the targets because that's when he starts winning more. Right. Exactly. Getting 8%, he doesn't win. He gets nothing. Yeah. So he's really motivated to, to earn you more. That's the only way he can earn more. Yeah. He, he can't earn unless he gets you over the hurdle uh, of 8%. Yeah. The investors should want the sponsor to be incentivized to do as much as we can. So um, by getting some of that split on the, on the end, that, that's our motivation. Well, last one I'll some throw in. It. When do they get their money back? Yeah. And so there's a couple different ways. First, we can do a refinance and uh, under our docs, a refinance, uh, uh, a recapital event, we have to pay back 100 percent of the investor capital first. And only then uh, can we split uh, profit after that. That's a refinance. And on a sale, obviously, 100 percent of the capital has to go back to the investor. And if we haven't been meeting the eight pref, we have to we have to bring that eight pref current. And then after the, the capital has been paid back and an eight press has been paid back, only then do we split on whatever the, the situation is, 65 to the money, 35 to the sponsor. And that typically, we typically go on a five year hold, but we've, we've done longer and it really just depends on market conditions. And we're constantly evaluating those to make sure we make the best decision for the investor. Thanks for uh, checking out how to invest in CRE. Make sure to like and subscribe, share if it helped you learn anything and we will see you next time. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Thank you.